All right, so last section of the semester. So to start, I know that there have been some cries to do some Ajax, but are there any other topics that we should be doing first? Let me switch over to the iPads that we have. And let me use black instead of orange. So Ajax is on the menu. Any other, any other topics that people want to see? I heard DOM too earlier. jQuery. OK. jQuery. We can make a stab at that too. XML. XML. OK. XML, JSON. OK. PHP, all good. C, all good. Hash tables, tries, linked lists. Oh, can we go over? So the, on the previous and on the quiz from last year, there uh -huh. is a table for the omega, the big old and big yeah. omega for the time, for the different kinds of inversions and deletions. Can we talk about that? Yeah, so we'll talk about a little bit of data structures yeah. and Data structures. Um, so we'll talk about some tries for sure. Can we talk about CSS a little bit? Yeah, we can do a little CSS. Any other topics, Sam? Scope in PHP. Scope. Scope in PHP. So HTTP. HTTP. Awesome. All right, so do we want to do, so I guess one way to do this would be to organize everything kind of chronologically and start with data structures since those were the earliest, or we can assign these some sort of priority weighting and go from there. So what do you guys think? Is there, is there something that everybody's dying to see? Let's, let's do a raise of hands. How about Ajax? How many of you guys want to know about Ajax? How many of you are like, man, Ajax, I got you. Nobody. All right, so Ajax is pretty high. Let's, let's start that guy. How about Dom? Everybody ready to rock Dom? Nope. OK, we'll start that one too. So jQuery. Queryless. Yes, OK, a couple of people for jQuery, but still, you know, people are a little more chill with that. OK, XML? XML. Mm. It's um, I mean, in the sense that, yeah, I mean, that's, yes, it, I mean, it is a key component of AJAX. So I guess we can bundle that with AJAX. Chat about the whole thing there. Uh, JSON. What is JSON? OK, cool. Uh, data structures? People feeling pretty good there? You know your linked lists, know your hash tables? How'd Speller go for everybody? That was a doozy, huh? Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, we can talk a little bit about those. But again, not as, not as important. CSS. Some s making, making your websites look pretty. OK. Scope in PHP. One big hand over there. Two big hands. Three. OK. Eh, maybe a medium hand. <laughs> yeah, Sam's, make, Sam's campaigning. Get your hands up. Uh, HTTP. OK. OK. So let's see. It looks definitely like Ajax and the DOM are up for grabs. So let's start with that. All right. So rather than, we, I guess we have a couple of options here. One is to kind of do a recap of what Ajax and XML are, since we didn't really have time to do that in section or in the problem sets. The other thing is to dive into some problems from previous year's quizzes <coughs> and see what's going on there. Any preference between the two? I think with concrete examples would be more helpful. Concrete examples more helpful? All right. Um, anyone's in particular, those of you from the Ajax crew, any problems we want to look at? Uh, the, um, is the event handler related to Ajax at all? Or I think that's Ah, so JavaScript okay. event handlers don't necessarily relate to Ajax. Okay. Um, they can. But yeah, that's another concept that I don't actually get. Okay. But the, in, I think in the quiz from the past year, there was one big problem in the 
um, later parts of the research that's related to ADAC and its impact in our community. All right. And Ellen? Oh, no, I, I feel like I know what ADAC is, but like I wouldn't know how to use it. Okay. I feel like I don't know what ADAC is or how to use it. Ah, <laughs> okay. That works pretty well. Okay, so let's see. Let's Let's maybe look at a good example of Ajax first. Welcome, welcome. I hope you are OK on camera. If not, you can hang out in the back. All right, let's see. Good example of Ajax. All right. So let me switch over to my laptop. So here we are at Google.com. How many of you guys have ever played the fun, like, how do I game on Google, right? How do I, you know, and you get to see all the fun things that come up. Um, you put this music on my Tumblr, and you can keep going and get all this sort of fun stuff. So what is happening here, right? As you type in the Google query box, right, the real-time results are updating. So put this, and you notice that all the results start updating on the Google web page, right? So that's not something that's happening on your computer, right? The network is involved in this. Google is involved with this, right? And it turns out that every time you press a key, like say G or L, right, and the search results update, What's happening is there's some JavaScript on the page that's detecting that you pressed a key, and it is making a network request to Google.com to load up all of the latest results that best fit the query that you've typed so far. Right? So unfortunately, I believe that if we were to look at this, I'm going to look at the source. Um, yeah, see, most of this AJAX or JavaScript code in here is all minified and often scrambled a little bit too. So the minification literally is its a program you can run your JavaScript code through, and it changes all your variable names and makes it totally unreadable, but tries to make your JavaScript as, as short as possible so that when you send your JavaScript files over the network, you're not having to load or send big files. Um, so this stuff is pretty hard to read. But buried in here, what powers this type ahead, is you know the buzzword for this, is AJAX requests, right? So, what makes an AJAX request different from any other kind of network request? Sam. Real -time URL. Right, exactly. So you notice, like as I change, as I type, right? How do I put my jawbone in pairing mode? <laughs> They're always some fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, you notice that this URL up here at the top isn't changing, right? And the entire page isn't refreshing. So if we look at what, you know, this, this kind of stuff right up here, right, this bar at the top, this Google, and then the, the black bar up here, which is often called like, you know, the Chrome of a web page, right? That's not changing. The entire page isn't refreshing, <coughs> right? The AJAX request is used to refresh just the results of the page, just that one little part of the page. So you're not having to go to an entirely different URL, an entire different file, and load that into memory. Right? So when you hear people talking about like the dynamic Web 2.0 type of revolution, this was behind a lot of it. Right? This is what enables you to write a wall post on Facebook, hit post, and have the post appear without the entire Facebook page refreshing. Right? Or you know, scroll through a bunch of photos and load the photos dynamically. Because how much would it suck if you went to your Facebook page, clicked on photos, and then had to sit there and wait while you know, all a you know, couple thousand of your Facebook photos loaded in, into memory? Right? Like that's a huge load. But with Ajax, you can do that asynchronously. And that's, that's the asynchronous part of the Ajax. Right? All right, so we good? Does everybody kind of understand roughly what AJAX is doing? It's, it's done by the JavaScript. 
it's done kind of dynamically and asynchronously after the page is loaded. It often comes in after as kind of a response to a um, to an event, which is either a mouse click or you know a, a key press or something like that. And then it generate or it makes a call back to the server, whether you're on Google.com or Facebook.com, retrieves some new content to then display or update or anything like that. Cool. All right. So let's look at a couple of examples from previous years. We'll go to the quizzes. And then Charlotte, you were mentioning quiz one from yeah. 2011. So one thing I will caution is that in looking at previous year's quizzes, you'll see this stuff called XHR often with relationship to AJAX, right? So XHR, an XML HTTP request, right, is kind of the raw way of doing AJAX, if you will. This year, we've transitioned to almost entirely using this jQuery library, right? jQuery is is a library of helper JavaScript functions and classes and all sorts of goodies. And jQuery kind of abstracts the raw XHR stuff away from you so that it's a lot easier to do the actual AJAX stuff. So as you're scrolling through these previous year's quizzes and you're seeing stuff that says like XHR and you know new XML HTTP request, all that kind of stuff, you can ignore that. Instead, we're going just the jQuery way. We don't expect you to know XML HTTP request. But good to know that it is synonymous with this idea of, of AJAX, right? This asynchronous JavaScript fetching XML, right, or JSON or whatever over the network. But originally, it was, it was correlated with XML or connected to XML. All right. So. Let's scroll down. You remember which problem in particular, Charlotte? Um, Was it this page that I'm looking at right here? Yeah, I think. Ah, I got it. Okay, yeah. So let's let's talk about this really quickly. So the way AJAX works is you've got some JavaScript file on your computer. And really, it's, it's running kind of in the context of your web browser. So if your final project, say, is to make, heck, I don't know, a new dating site for Harvard people, and you want your dating site to have the ability to send anonymous messages from, people, from person to person, or anonymous like Facebook wall-like posts, right? And you want to use AJAX in that somehow so that when you post a message, it doesn't refresh the entire site. In your JavaScript code, you would set up a new AJAX call, a new AJAX call. Um, and I'm debating whether or not to do this on the laptop. The important part about the AJAX call is that there is this kind of asynchronous a asynchronicity to it in the sense that, let me do switch back to my iPad. Um, so switching back to the iPad. So in the sense that if I have code that's going to say, you know, do some AJAX, right? Then I can't, on the very next line of my JavaScript code, expect that the AJAX will have completed, right? Um, what happens is that as your code runs sequentially in JavaScript, when you make this AJAX call, you're essentially forking off and sending a request out to the internet to you know, some server over here, which is this box I'm drawing. I'm clearly not drawing it very well. Um, but you're forking off this call to the server that's going to take some time as it goes off to the internet, right? And goes and hits that server and goes and calls that PHP script that you've written on the back end to actually record that message, that anonymous message in your database or something like that. So that'll take some time. And then eventually, when the server is done processing your AJAX request, it will return 
it will return to your JavaScript code, but you don't really know where, at what point in the execution, you're going to receive this response, right? So how is this handled in JavaScript? This is where it comes into this problem that we're talking about on the laptop, where you register <coughs> a handler, right? You register a particular JavaScript function to run when the AJAX request is finished, right? So you can't just make your AJAX call and then in the very next line of code assume that the AJAX call has completed, right? There's no, like, part of the beauty of this is you want your JavaScript to continue to run after it's made the AJAX call, right? Because it can fork off the separate request and keep processing other things, right? You've got this kind of concurrency going here where your JavaScript continues to run and keep doing other fun things, could continue to spin out other AJAX requests. Your AJAX requests just go out to the network and then come back whenever they come back. But when you register this handler function, that's when you know that your AJAX call has returned because this function gets called. So you kind of have this, instead of having this sequential execution path that we're used to in C, you have what's more similar to what we saw in <coughs> Scratch at the beginning of the semester, right? Where you have these broadcasts and then you have these, you know, when green flag clicked or when I receive this event. That's essentially what's happening here in, in JavaScript with these AJAX requests. So for the answer to this question on line 20, in the context of AJAX, what does this line of code do? Well, can somebody kind of paraphrase what I just said to confirm understanding? I'm sorry, what is the last half of it say? XHR on ready state change. Yeah. Oh, sorry, am I getting cut off? Yeah, so this is that XHR syntax that we won't have to deal with. But you have the similar concept with, with the jQuery. Let's go to source code Wednesday index. Let's look this up. All right. Got it. OK. So here is that, that AJAX syntax that we're talking about, right? Here, you're specifying the AJAX request. You're saying, this is, this is the URL I want to go out and ping. I want to use post as opposed to get, right? And then the data type is I want JSON to be returned. Again, XML is kind of the traditional thing. But <coughs> what we're looking for is that function. This is that right here. This, this function response is that on ready state change. This is the handler. This is what will execute when this request comes back, right? So you notice that this function that Tommy has written right here that we talked about in, in lecture on Wednesday was all about creating that fun type ahead for us, right? And you notice that what he's doing is he's building the AJAX request, and then there's nothing after, right? There's nothing after the AJAX request. He's not processing the response of the AJAX request after the call is made. He's only doing it in this handler function, right, that will be called as soon as the response does come back. Sam. Does the AJAX request have to be a try post or can it be get? They can be either. How would yeah. that work if you're not changing the URL? How would that work if you're not changing the URL? Well, so the it, it just depends on like where the data is going. Okay. Right? So the question is can AJAX requests be post or get? And that's where it, it, it can be either. It's just really a semantic difference between post and get. Um, so get typically means that you're just reading something from the server and you're not changing anything, whereas a post typically implies that you're writing data or you're writing something to a server. Right? So often you use post when you're trying to change state somewhere. That's why logins <coughs> always go with HTTP post. right? 
whereas Google makes a bunch of get requests. And actually, if we go back to our Google example and let's look at our, if we look at our developer tools here, where am I going? Developer. Let's look at the developer tools here at the bottom and open up the network. Right, as we start typing, right, you can see all of these get requests coming in. Right? You see all these get requests here at the bottom of the screen, right? That are all of these, you know, XJS. This is the this is the XML, this is the or the sorry, this is the Ajax request coming back. Right? And if we were to click on it, we can see what you know, what it's saying and what its response is, right? And it's giving us all this information about the response that we got when we set or when we sent to Google the, you know, headers that were down here. Let's see if it has, it'll have our query string somewhere. Do, 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 do. Headers, maybe. Request URL. Yeah, so. Original query, ignore bad query, second pass. Um, how I meter. Anywhere. Somewhere, somewhere in here you can find this how I meter query in the request made to the server. And then the response coming back is what we're seeing. So yes, that can be either get or post. It tends to be just a semantic difference. We can cover that with HTTP. Yes, Ella. So is the difference between JSON and XML that JSON is more modern? Um, so XML and JSON are just two different ways of encoding data, right? So XML is the extensible markup language, right? HTML is actually kind of like is a subset of XML, right? So for example, let's pull up text edit, right? So XML is just defined as data that's enclosed in a series of tags, right? So HTML slash HTML, right? These guys are valid tags. Let's blow up this size here, make it more readable, right? Hello, right? XML just defines a tag as being something like this, where you have an open angle bracket, the name of the tag, and then any number of attributes, which in HTML we often don't have attributes. But for example, if we had a script tag, often it has the type of text JavaScript, right? And inside of the tags is data, right? In true XML, you can actually define these tags to be whatever you want, right? It's just a way of structuring your information. So for example, if I wanted to encode, say, my family in XML, I could do something like, you know, this, like father, and then, you know, put information about him, and, you know, brother, and put information about my brother, right? And just this, this way of structuring your data is XML. JSON, on the other hand, follows the JavaScript object notation, hence JSON, JSON. And so rather than writing <coughs> with this kind of tag, closed tag type format, we instead write it as a JavaScript object, right? So the JavaScript object has the curly brace to open things and then a curly brace to close things. So let me zoom out a little bit, zoom in. And then what you have are the names of fields. <coughs> so father. And then I could put information about him. 
right? And then, a, you know, brother, colon, and information about my brother, right? And of course, you know, everything in here is, that I guess, what's nice about JSON as opposed to XML, right, is because a JSON object, right, a JSON object is in this object notation that JavaScript has. JavaScript can really easily pull that into memory and treat it just as a JavaScript object right when you receive it back from the server. There's no parsing that it really has to do that's heavy duty or heavy lifting. Whereas with XML, you have to use either plugins or some sort of, depending on what exactly you're transmitting um, and what you're using to receive the XML, you might have to do a little bit more work parsing. Whereas this JavaScript stuff, if you're if you're just writing with JavaScript and you're receiving JavaScript back, it's really easy to work with. Um, the other thing that people will also mention sometimes is that with XML, you have all of these open tags and closed tags, so it can get big. It can get a little bloated. So there are some who will talk about how with JSON, you don't have the, all these open tags and closed tags, so it's... Uh, more compressed. And the reason that that's important is that when you have to load things over the network, when you're talking to a remote server, the less that needs to be transmitted over the internet, the faster everything goes. Right. Anyway, the key takeaway here is there are just two different ways of structuring your data, formatting your data. All right. Other questions? Charlotte? Um, one last question about the syntax of Ajax. Sure. So we can go back to the um, yeah. example of quotes and just zoom out a little bit. There's this one line of code above the can you zoom or go up? Yeah. Um, on key up yes. on the function. So is that set of empty parentheses after on key up referring to the function after success? So no. What so a couple of things here. This is on key up, this is a way of, of doing the equivalent in Scratch of you know when a key is pressed and you lift up off of the key. So not you have actually in JavaScript you have on key down, on key up, and on key press, right? And you can trigger, you can capture events that you or you can you can do things on each of those three different events, right? So what this is registering a, an event handler anytime a key comes up. And then this function is this entire thing, right, all the way down to there, right? Now, this function doesn't have a name. Kind of weird. All of our functions we've done in C, in PHP, have all had names, right? This is what we call an anonymous function. Makes sense, right? No name, anonymous. What's handy about the anonymous function? Well, clearly, we can't call this function anywhere else in our code, right? How would we call this function elsewhere in our code, right? We can't, right? There's no name. I can't say, oh yeah, call that function that I you know, said with on key up. What's handy about it, though, is that in JavaScript, when we are constantly registering these event handlers, that's what this is called. You're registering this function as a handler when a key comes up, is it's really nice to be able to just define these functions kind of in line and just say, oh, yeah, when, when the key up is pressed, like remember this function that I'm going to define right here, and it'll remember this function. And then it'll read, it'll do this function whenever a key comes up. This has nice, we'll talk about this more once you get more into functional programming. This is a little bit of a taste of that, where we're essentially passing a function around as an object, as almost as if it were like a variable, right? Rather than passing a string or an int, we're passing a function. So that, that's kind of a, a weird thing. But what's nice is that all of the variables in here inside of this function, right? that are 
the scoping issues are nice because if you have a function up here, or if you have, sorry, a variable up here, you can refer to that variable inside of this function because this function is declared inside of this other function. So you get to have benefits like that. Again, that's something that is more meta. You'll cover it in future classes, but yeah. Um, since the function's anonymous, can it be used somewhere else, or can it only be used in the context of like this function? It can only it is used only in the context of this function. Yeah. Does yes. Does this have something to do with the, with the fact that it's an object-oriented language? Does it have something to do with the fact that it's object-oriented? Um, so. Let's see. I, I would say that this has more to do with the fact that this has functional aspects, right? So we're talking about the object-oriented paradigm of programming, and this is kind of one of those aspects of the functional paradigm of programming, <laughs> where you are, yeah, you, you are making functions that are composed of other functions, and you are um, passing passing functions around. So JavaScript is a functional language, also. It has elements of it, yes. Yeah, yeah. JavaScript and many I, so PHP has some of this too. Python has has the same sort of stuff. Um, Ruby has this sort of stuff as well. And this is common in more of these modern languages. Just as you, you know, you really get these scripting languages that are kind of jack of all trades. It's like the big fatty Swiss Army knife. You know, the one that like you can't even put in your pocket because it's too wide. It's kind of how some of these languages have become. Any other questions? All right. How are you guys feeling? Let's go back to that quiz really quick and see if we can answer 21 and, and, and 20. So we talked about 20 as we registered this handler, <coughs> right? Um, this question here, what would be the effect if we wrote that line with a pair of parentheses. So you see the difference? How up at the top there are no parentheses, and down here there are parentheses after the function name. Right? So one thing that is important to note here, we're referring to a function. This is not an anonymous function. It's been given a name, handler. Right? Whereas in our Ajax over here that we were just looking at, all of the functions that we were passing around were all anonymous, right? No function name, no function name. But we could have defined, it, so it is common practice to define these functions kind of inline as anonymous functions um, for some of the scoping benefits. You could also, could very well have defined this function right here, <coughs> or this on key up function. You could have defined this guy as functions with names elsewhere in your JavaScript code. And then instead of defining the function here, you would pass the name of the function right in this spot. right? One thing to note is that you wouldn't want to use the parentheses if you were passing the name of the function. Because when you use the parentheses, you're implying call this function. right? Whereas instead, here we just want to pass the name of the function. right? So if we look at what's going on here, the, the big difference is that this top line of code says effectively maintain a pointer to the function called handler and when the ajax call completes call this function actually you know perform the function plug in the arguments do all that work whereas this line down here says instead of maintaining a pointer to the function called handler this on ready state change field is going to hold the result of a function called to handler. So it's going to evaluate handler. It's going to actually call handler right now, not when the Ajax call completes, but right now, which is not what you want to do if you're writing something to deal with an Ajax call that's completed. <coughs> All right. Questions about that? It's a subtle difference. It's a subtle difference. 
So one thing I would definitely suggest doing if you haven't done it because you know, this is new stuff, it takes a while for it to really sink in unless you actually you know, type some of this stuff out. I'd encourage you to go through the source code that Tommy presented in lecture on Wednesday because he definitely went through a lot of stuff kind of in a blur. I'd actually try typing it out, right? Try, try coding some stuff up. You know, make a .js file, you know, type out the code yourself. Don't just copy and paste. Don't just run CP and try doing that just to kind of flex your JavaScript muscle. See what, see what the things are. Try, you know, for example, here, you know, I'm, I'm looking at quote 7.js in the source code from Wednesday's lecture. Try going in and instead of just making all of these functions anonymous, right, copy this code, literally just like go down to this success code, you know, copy this, paste it into another function and give it a name and then try passing the name in and see what happens. Could that be in a separate file or could be in the same file? It could be in a separate file if you properly include it. One thing that's going to be, let's see, does this, so the trick is, 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 does anything in this function, does this function refer to any of the variables that are outside of it? <coughs> and I think it only refers to response. Yeah. So you can definitely call, you can, you can name this, you can pull it out, you can give it a name, and then you can pass the name in here. So I'd give that a try, you know, see, see how that works. All right. Questions? Questions. I love questions. I don't know about you guys, but I like them. How are you guys feeling about this? There's kind of this like, oh, crap, <laughs> mood in the room. Is that kind of how you guys are feeling? Yeah. Eh? Eh? Yes. I Daniel. think I understand kind of the overall concepts that you're uh -huh. talking about, like the anonymous functions and like all this stuff, but I, I don't <coughs> understand half the syntax that's up there right now. Okay. Like I like what UL means, LI, these different tags and sure. like I don't think I'd be able to code something with JavaScript. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Is that a common Common feeling, common sentiment. Sounds like okay. <coughs> Will we need to code? So you should be prepared to dissect something like this. I would say. I mean, I'm not the one writing the exam, um, but I would definitely say that if if that is a common sentiment, that kind of the, a lot of the syntax here looks like you know what the hell's going on. I'm totally swimming. Then. <coughs> Let's talk about that and fix that. Sound good? All right. So what's going on here? Let's take this line by line. And let's try going around the room. And I'm just going to call on people one by one and give me your best guess. And you got, we'll, we'll do it fast. So you got five seconds to answer. If you don't answer, we move to the next person. And it's not a big deal, because I know this is crazy stuff. Um, all right, so we'll start over here. Charlotte, what does this line do? Right. So, Jimmy, what is UL? Um, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> cool. So, Charlotte was totally right. This line of code that I've highlighted right here declares a variable called suggestions, a JavaScript variable. Um, we've got this var keyword in front, which makes sure that the variable stays local to the scope that it's in. And this UL thing that we haven't seen before, really. Um, let's see if there's a good, do, 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 do. let me switch back to my iPad. All right, new page. So I'm sure you guys have seen the UL before. It's an unordered list, right? So have you ever seen on a web page where you have the bullets and you have like, you know, thing one, thing two, and so on and so forth. This is an unordered list, right? The way you would code this in HTML 
is you'd start with an open tag that opens the unordered list. You'd close it with a close tag that closes the unordered list. And then in the middle, you'd have to list items, li, right? And inside the li's would be the text to display. So thing one and thing two. <laughs> and we'd close our, our list item tags, right? So unordered lists are super common because it's a great way to get you know, the same styling applied to like a row of things. So if you look in, for example, the PSET 7 code, like a lot of the nav pills, the navigation pills that were used for like the different links to like buy, sell, quote, history, all of that, those are implemented as unordered lists, right? And they used CSS to remove these bullet points and kind of change things around slightly, right? So this, that's kind of the power of the CSS is that the HTML describes the structure, right? We've got a list. We've got a list of list items. It's unordered, right? There's no first, second, or third. It's just a list. Um, and so by default, it'll draw it with just bullets. If we instead had written OL, right? So I'm going to change this to an OL list as, as opposed to a UL. What would that do? Well, it would get rid of these bullets. And the default would instead be a numbered list. Right, because now we've got ordering. So the styling of the list is then what you play around with in, in CSS. And that's where the folks who wrote the bootstrap library for CSS played around with the styling of an unordered list to get it to display like that, you know, those nice little nav pills. Um, if we look at Google, for example, Let's take a look at this guy. So back to how I meter your mother. Um, sounds kind of German. And <laughs> if we, I love German. It sounds so fun. Um, I'm sorry if there are any German folks watching who feel offended. Anyway, um, so if we look at these links up here at the top, right? And we look at what's going on there. We can inspect it using this little, this guy. I'm down, way down here in the corner. This developer tools on Chrome is awesome. If you guys start to play around with it or look up tutorials for it. It'll soup help a lot if you're doing web-based projects. Anyway, so I've clicked my little inspector. I'm going to scroll back up here. I'm going to see what all these guys are. Right, so zoom in. I'm going to click on these. Then I can zoom back out and see what it actually is in the HTML way down here. Right? And it looks like Google has nested it in an ordered list. Right, so we've got this span that says plus u, and that's nested inside an anchor tag. So that's what makes it clickable, and it links it to my Google Plus page. It's nested inside a list, um, gosh, uh, yeah, 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 a list item, right? And it's nested inside this ordered list. And now if I actually click the list item, it'll highlight it for me um, up there. If I highlight the unordered list, you see how the focus goes at the top. It shifts up and shows me the entire ordered list, right? So Google's just played around with a styling to get these lists to show up like that. Anyway, so back to, that's enough fun with lists, back to the quiz or this stuff. So now we know what an unordered list is, hopefully. Let's talk about this next line of code. For var i in response.symbols. Ella, thoughts? No idea. OK. You've seen a for loop before, yeah. I presume. Um, you remember doing for each in PHP? Yeah. This is exactly that. Okay. Yeah. So this is, this is a for each loop in JavaScript. Right? This is a shorter way than doing the for var i equals 0, i less than response.symbols.length, i++, plus plus, which we could do. right? 
but this is a more concise way of writing it. One thing to be careful of in JavaScript is that this doesn't necessarily follow the um, order. If response.symbols is you know, presumably an array, right? Var i will be, you know, an index into this array, but it isn't necessarily the zero and then the one and then the two and then the three. So they do say, you know, be you know, use the four var i equals zero if you really if you care about the ordering. Um, I guess the other thing is to note that when we used a for each in PHP, right, we specified the for the array name first, and then we had the as keyword, and then we specified the value that we wanted to retrieve from the array. Or we could specify both the key and the value that we wanted to retrieve from the array. Um, here, we're just getting the index, right? We're not getting, we're not getting uh, the actual element itself, right? So you see that when we go down here, we are actually having to retrieve the ith element out of the symbol response.symbols array or object, right? So you can actually, so the other thing that's crazy about this is you can use this to loop over objects in JavaScript and retrieve each of the properties of that object one by one. Right? So if we went back to that JavaScript object notation depiction of my family, right, where it was literally that those curly braces and then like father, brother, mother, you know, all that, you could use a for loop to iterate over that as well and retrieve the properties one by one. Kind of crazy. All right. So what we're doing, it looks like, is we're building up an HTML string, just like this comment says, building up an HTML string for the list of suggestions. So we're going to start out with our open tag for our unordered list, in which we presume we're going to store all the suggestions as list items. Then we're going to loop over all of the symbols in the response, right? Because remember, this is a type ahead for CS50 finance. So we're pulling out the, the stock symbols one by one. And then we're adding to our suggestion string what, Jared? What does this look like? Seems like it's grabbing from um, some kind of database, whatever letter you're typing in. Uh -huh. It should be some kind of suggestion of what word. Yeah. So the Ajax request already actually did go and grab that. This is our response. So this is actu actually after we've gotten the response from the database, from the server. And so what is, what is this? What does the single quote thing denote? The single quote? Yeah. It's just a string, right? Yeah. <coughs> and so what is this crafting? It's a string, that, and we're putting stuff in the string. And what is the string looking just, like? It's just a suggestion of what word. Might yeah. Be. Yeah, exactly. It's the suggestion nested inside an anchor tag, right? And that is also anchored inside a list item, right? So it'll go inside the list. So literally, all we're doing here is we're just building up a big HTML string, right? We're just building it up literally as like a string in memory, right? So we're not doing anything fancy. We're not like we're, we're not creating new nodes in the DOM or anything like that. We're literally just like building a string, as if you were to write out, for example, on your iPad, like I have. In case you guys have an iPad and like writing HTML on your iPad, um, you're just writing a big long string. It's like ul li a da 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 da, and then we're of course going to terminate it with this ul. Right, that's all we're getting is one big massive string. <coughs> And inside, there's an li and an a for each of the symbols that we found. All right. And now, continuing on, what does this line do, Stella? Right here. Um, 
What does this line do right here? Yeah, it's just adding this guy. We're just ending our list, exactly. And then this final line, and this looks kind of goofy, right? I'm sorry, I don't know your name in the red sweatshirt. Do you know what this does? Uh, or are you going to decide no? And, and you? It calls jQuery on it, but I don't exactly know what it's called. Yeah, it calls jQuery. How about anybody here over on the left side of me know what, what this line does? What does it seem like it's doing? If you had to guess. It's submitting to the HTML the list of suggestions, or is it like? Yeah, what do you mean by submitting? Like saying to the HTML this, what we just dealt with in JavaScript is now definitely just HTML. Yeah, so that, that's, that's a great start. Let's, let's dissect this a little more. So that's exactly what this part is doing right here. What aspect of it makes it clear it's jQuery? Ah, so jQuery is this dollar sign guy. So whenever you're writing jQuery, you will see this dollar sign all over the place. Um, and this has just been used in jQuery as kind of a special, like a special symbol. It does a whole bunch of things. In the context of this right here, this line, or this part of the line, right? It is a selector, right? It is the, J it is the jQuery selector, and it is selecting the HTML element that has the ID suggestions. So remember how HTML elements can have that ID attribute, where you can have like a paragraph tag that has like ID suggestions? This jQuery selector will grab that element, right? because that element sort of ha it has to exist somewhere in memory. right? JavaScript is able to kind of pinpoint that element and say, oh, OK, you are the paragraph that has this ID. And then this dot HTML says, OK, replace the current HTML inside of you with this new string, this new HTML that I'm going to give you. So if we look back over at the iPad, haha, I remember to switch this time. So imagine, and you often insert into things like divs, right? So imagine we had a div that had ID <coughs> suggestions. Right? And we're gonna close the div tag down here. Right? When we use the jQuery selector to grab the item that has, or the element in the DOM that has the ID of suggestions, it literally selects this entire div right here. And then the, dot, the HTML method says replace all of this stuff right in here, right in that UL, that unordered list that we just built up. Literally, like if you were viewing the entire HTML files, say like a string in memory, you would just say, OK, go into that spot and plunk in that UL stuff. And then render, update the page <coughs> so that you now see the unordered list there. So what this has effectively done is it's dynamically updated this div. The code that we just saw on the laptop has updated this, this div to hold the new suggestions that were retrieved from the server somewhere. Which yeah, suggestions Jared. represents the new suggestions and the old suggestions? The new suggestions and the old well, suggestions. Which one, which one represents which one's being replaced <coughs> and which one's being replacing? Got it. So see right here, this guy is a string. right? This specifies the <coughs> ID of an element. We call it in the DOM, which literally just means like some HTML element that is somewhere being displayed on the web page. Right? So the context, if we were to look at this, right, if we go back to our Google page, we see all these divs and these OLs and these LIs and these A's, right? These all constitute the HTML elements that currently make up this page. Right? All of these, they're, you know, these all 
cor you know, correlate to individual elements on the page. And if we were to change this, you would watch actually the DOM change. And you can see this kind of shifting. So if we were to type you know, Harvard, you'd see the DOM start to change and the list elements starting to change in here. Right? That's actually what's happening. Right? Let's see if we can find. So let's see if we can find some of this stuff right in here. So let's look at kind of, say, this link. Let's look at this Harvard Wikipedia link and we'll watch it change. Right? So you can see that as I've selected this, it, is, it corresponds to this div right here, which is also part of a list element, which is right next to another list element, which is part of the unordered list here. Right? So now what happens if we search for you know, our lesser school, a little down south, right? it now changes. Right? So we lost our handle on that div and that list element because now we have different elements in our DOM, different list elements, different list items, different links, all of that. Right? So this HTML document is being dynamically updated. Old elements are being deleted. New elements are being added. So back here, we're just specifying this this element, which presumably will be stable throughout our type ahead update, right? Because otherwise, if we don't have an, if, we, if jQuery can't find an element that has an idea of suggestions, it'll just crash at this point. And then we're updating its inner HTML, right? So it's these list items, these anchor tags that will constantly update and refresh as you type. Does that do a better job? <coughs> that helps a lot. OK. So this syntax, that, so the syntax that you'll see a lot, right? <coughs> know what this guy does, right? Know the jQuery selector, right? This jQuery selector with a hashtag in front implies an ID, right? So this guy says, get me the element that has ID suggestions, right? This guy down here also says, get me that same element with ID suggestions. This guy below it is slightly more complex, right? This says, get me the element with ID form hyphen quote, but then go inside that form and find the child. So this space right here implies that, OK, we're going to a child element, a nested element. So find the form that has this ID, and then find the input inside that form whose name is symbol. And this is, this is definitely in Tommy's lecture slides, these different types of jQuery selectors. But you should know what kinds of elements these are retrieving. So for example, let's switch back to the iPad really quickly. We'll draw a new. So if we had a form element with ID form quote, uh, close that. Of course, that's missing, missing the method equals post or method equals get and action <coughs> attributes as well that you should have on forms. But just for this example, you know, a form, as you know, has inputs, right? And that code that we just saw would get the input with, it would get the input um, element that had name equal to symbol, right? So this is important when you're trying to fill different fields inside of your form. 
This is how autofilling works, right? Yes, Ella. An ID in a class. Or what is a class? Yeah. So a class is used for styling purposes, <coughs> right? An ID is used for what it sounds like uniquely identifying a particular element, right? So within an HTML page, you can only have one element with a particular ID, right? So there is only one form with the ID form quote, right? However, um, the nav pills class or nav class was probably something that you used possibly or saw in the context of your problem set seven code. A class is used to apply a particular styling to a bunch of different elements. So for example, in, in the old days of HTML, before there were style sheets, before there was CSS, before these cascading style sheets, if you wanted to, you know, say, center a paragraph or center the text in a, in a div, right, you'd have a div and then you'd have something like text align equal to center as like an attribute within your div, right? And this is no good. And the reason people didn't like this is because then when you wanted to update how things displayed on your website, you had to literally go into like every page and every HTML file and go change all the stylings on all the different elements and it was a huge pain. Because often you wanted to have a bunch of divs that were all center aligned or you know fit a certain way. So the solution to that was the class. So now we have a div where we have the class specified to be, you know, whatever you want to call it. The class is, you know, you could call it, you know, centered. close your div somewhere down here and you have all your fun stuff in there. And then somewhere in your style sheet, you would specify a particular styling that would apply to this class. And this didn't have to be the only div that was centered. Right? You could have other divs that also had centered text. All right. Yes, Charlotte. Going back to the quote, what does the dot mean? What is the dot? Yeah. In, oops, back to the laptop you mean? Yeah. Okay. So sometimes it seems to, so for instance in this line, does that mean that there's this variable called val inside of the form? Yeah. So the dot notation in JavaScript does a couple of things, okay. right? So dot is sometimes used, in this case, it, you are calling a function whose name is val, right? It's, it's a method. This is, this is where we get into the object-oriented stuff that we were talking about, Sam. This is where objects, in this case, the input element, has a function or a method called val that basically says, hey, <coughs> set your value to be this thing, right? Instead of, imagine if we, you know, instead of the gobbledygook, we had written, you know, the number seven or the string seven, right? That would change the value of this input element to be seven. The input element being everything in front of the dot? The input element, exactly, being the element within the HTML, within the, the DOM, mm -hmm. that matches this query. So it's input element dot function and then what that value should be. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And you also use this to access properties. So if we look back up at the code that we were walking through line by line, where we have response.symbols sub i dot name, right? We're not calling a function here, right? There are no parentheses. 
So one thing that you should just kind of keep in mind as you, as you rip through this code, right? When you see parentheses, that means function call, right? A function is being called. And the name of that function is whatever precedes those parentheses. So in, in this case down below, it's val. In this case right here, it's HTML, right? In this case right here, the name of the function is literally dollar sign, right? And we just know that this is the, oh, that's the jQuery selector. It's the function that is selecting whatever this guy is. And then when you don't see parentheses, like here or here, what you're accessing instead is a property of the object. So this is like using the array notation. It's a, you know alternative to using the, the array notation. That's just a, a shorthand. Right, so we're accessing the symbols <coughs> field of the response object. All right. So we've done a lot on Ajax DOM, some HTML, not much CSS. Do you guys want to spend the last 15 minutes or so on this? I guess we've really got about 10 minutes before we need to start wrapping up. Or should we go back and talk about some of the other things on our list? Let's see. So if we go back to the beginning, let me switch over to my iPad again so you guys can see this. Um, we've done a lot of AJAX. We've done some jQuery. We've done some JSON, we've done some XML, we've done some DOM, we've done some HTTP, nope, not HTTP, scratch that. Not much scope, we sort of talked about CSS, not really. Let's see, do you guys feel good on, H on AJAX? Do you want to spend more time on AJAX? Show of hands. Okay, DOM, anybody want to spend more time on DOM? The easiest way to really kind of get a feel for like what's going on with, th with the DOM the, the DOM sound, it's, it, people talk about it and you know, throw around, oh, the DOM, the DOM, this, the DOM, that. Really, the DOM is just the, it's just the way all of these HTML elements are held in memory. And it's just explaining, that, like that's what it is. It's just, it's structured like a tree and you can, access individual elements, individual HTML elements with that jQuery selector, that dollar sign thingy. You can manipulate things. You can add elements to the DOM. You can add a new paragraph element to the DOM. You can take away a div element from the DOM if you want. That's all it is. It's just kind of the in-memory representation of your, of your HTML file. It can be manipulated and traversed. And How about jQuery? That selector. Yes, Sam. Does that mean that the DOM includes all of your CSS and, and uh, JavaScript? The DOM includes those nodes, yes. So it includes like the HTML, but those other auxiliary documents output? Uh, so yes, yeah, so if, if JavaScript modifies the HTML like it was doing in this, you know, in this Google, whoops, sorry, I'm not back on that. Um, so remember how JavaScript would modify the list of Google results, right? So if JavaScript modifies that, right, then those new list elements are now part of the DOM, right? They were injected into the DOM. And it turns out that the scripts and the style sheets themselves are indeed part of the DOM, right? You see down here that we've got these, you know, script nodes and these style nodes JavaScript can add and delete these too, right? This is why it's so bad to have malicious JavaScript on your page is that it can now start bringing in other JavaScript from other places, right? So you can start out with just one JavaScript file, but then it can start pulling in other JavaScript files. You can use Ajax to load in JavaScript and dynamically you know, have new JavaScript running on your, <coughs> on your web page. So it's a really powerful thing that you know our browsers are able to kind of constantly re-render and readapt whatever is being generated by JavaScript. And those style tags are contained in CSS? 
Let's look at it. Yep. So this CSS, again, the, you can see where jQuery got its selector from, right? We've got this hashtag GB, which is saying, oh, this is, you know, this, this styling applies to an element with ID GB. An element with ID GB is going to have this size font with this font family, sans serif, height, right? OK. Back to the iPad. Um, how about data structures? Tries, linked lists. You guys want to do a quick refresher on that? Or are you guys feeling yay, nay? Who wants data structures? Raise your hand. Who hates data structures? I only want tries. You only want tries. Only want tries. OK. Um, does anybody not want tries? Is everybody like, I hate tries. I did it. I tried it. Oh, you just want to know? Okay, well, we can we can definitely go over that. D does that sound like something that we want to do as a group? Mm -hmm. Yes, sort of. No. How about HTTP? Does that seem something like more people want to do, or are you kind of? Eh? Let's do H HTTP first. Um. All right. So, how many of you guys have seen David's <coughs> ridiculously awesome HTTP short? Anybody? I've seen it a whole bunch. It was one of the first ones we did, and so it was like our demo this summer. Dan's seen it a bunch, too. Dan the man back there. Um, OK, so HTTP, and then there's this HTTPS thing that we've been talking about a little bit. What do you need to know about HTTP? Well, it's literally just the protocol for interacting with a web server, right? So when you want to talk to google.com, right? You're talking to another computer over a network. Like, what do you do, you know? Let's maybe do this. Let me pull up a terminal. So here's my little terminal window. We can do something like telnet, which allows us to actually start a connection to google.com. This is not something you need, you need to know, but it's just to illustrate what's happening with the HTTP. www.google.com, port 80, right? And so what is this doing? Well, it's making an internet connection between my computer and Google, right? And it's actually connecting to 173.194.75.99, which is some computer, right? Some Google server living somewhere in actually probably probably out here, though it might be all the way back in California. Um, and now I'm connected. OK, that's all good. <coughs> but when you go to Google.com, typically you expect Google.com some HTML to show up, right? Not just this. Well, so the problem is, is I want to say, give me Google.com, Google.com, or whatever. But if I say that, like nothing happens, right? In fact, if I hit enter a couple of times, it comes back and it says, hey, that was, that was a bad request, right? And this was saying, no, 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 no. Like you can't just put stuff in. You actually have to speak HTTP to me. You have to format your request as an HTTP request, as a GAD or a POST or something like that. And then I'll return the proper HTML to you. Right? So you see what it gave me in this case was it gave me this bad, or it gave me HTML that if I you know, copy it and let's say I text edit um, HTML, or if I put it in here and I save it as test.html, um, oh, come on. Web page. There we go. Now, if I open downloads <laughs> test.html, oh, now it gave me the bad. I didn't quite render it as <coughs> HTML. Oh, it looks like it didn't close it. Here, let's see.
Nope. Okay. It's not going to render. Anyway, not going to figure that out. But anyway, it, what it is doing is it's returning to me the HTML, but it's saying essentially, like, you didn't give me a proper HTTP request. Right? So what do we need to know about HTTP? Well, it's the way of formatting requests to web servers to get typically HTML in response. Um, the other thing to note is that when you make a request to a web server, you have to specify typically the HTML or that sorry the HTTP method that you want to use. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, where the two big ones that we see are, are get and post. Right? There are also a whole bunch of other ones. There's like head and put and delete and all these other things. Um, but get and post are the two main ones. Where do you see those crop up? Well, when you're writing forms. Right? When you're writing HTML forms, you have to specify the HTTP method by which you want that form data to be transmitted. And then you see it on the server side when you're writing PHP code. When you handle the data and you have to look in like the post super global or the get super global to retrieve the data that was submitted by the user. And the difference between get and post is that get modifies the actual URL, right? And for the most part, the you know it's you can see what parameters were passed to a get request very easily just by looking in the URL. Whereas with a post request, you don't transmit the parameters of the request in the URL. But they're not encrypted or anything unless you're going over HTTPS. Right? Um, the post parameters are just part of the, the they're, they're, they don't go in the URL effectively. So we tend to use just to kind of semantically separate the two, which just says that, you know, really, you can do the same thing with get that you can with post. Right? You, you can do the same thing. It's just that we use them in different situations. We use get when we're trying to just read something and we're just saying, give me this data. And we use post typically when we're trying to update something on the server. Right? That's why whenever you go to google.com and we were doing that type ahead, we saw those get requests because we were literally just retrieving information from Google. Whereas if you make a Facebook wall post, <coughs> you're going to be using most likely an HTTP post method to send that data and make a change to Facebook and your, your wall, your friend's wall. Um, let's see, the other, do, 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 do. and then I guess the difference with HTTPS is that it is HTTP but encrypted, <laughs> secure. And there are a lot of fun details about that. <coughs> Questions? We need to start wrapping up, and so we'll do some data structures on the side. Charlotte? What's included in the HTTP header file aside from the host, the method, and the method? Uh, best way to look at it, and the response code. Best way to look at it is to go to your network tab and just see what happens when you say, just go to google.com, right? You can come down here and you can see all of the different HTTP requests that were made, right? Google.com, right? So the first one was I tried to go to google.com and it said, oh, google.com doesn't really exist. What you really want to go is to www.google.com. So I got redirected here. That's where I got this 301, then I got the 200 OK. So what is in here? in your headers. Well, it says this is the URL to which I made the request, the request method, and then the status code. Those are the three biggies. The other things in here, cookies, right? So cookies are handy for <coughs> figuring out the session, right, if somebody's logged in or not. They're also handy for tracking people. Right? This is how websites track you all over the place. They recognize, they put cookies on your computer. They're trained to recognize other websites' cookies if they can. And then there's this other stuff that says like the user agent right here, this user agent string identifies my computer to, to Google.com and says, oh, hey, Google.com, just so you know, 
some dude running this browser on Intel Mac 1082 just went to Google.com. And then these accept things just say, OK, what, if, what is my computer, what is my web browser prepared to accept? It can accept HTML. It can accept XML, all this other stuff. What kind of character encodings does it accept? Does it accept gzipped, like compressed stuff? Sometimes websites will compress things to make it faster to send over the network. Cool. All right. So I think that's it for now. We'll close down, but I will remain for questions.